anti-VEGF agents, uh, you know, traditionally have been the first line of therapeutic agents for the management of macular edema secondary to diabetes. However, all the literature suggests that almost 40% of DME patients show uh, more than three lines of improvement with anti-VEGF, suggesting the role of multiple factors, that is, inflammation in the etiopathogenesis of DME. <coughs> so, among eyes that showed limited in initial visual improvement also with the anti-VEGF, only 20 to 30 percent of these patients show a clinically significant long-term visual response with continued anti-VEGF therapy over the next three years. So, what is the role of anti-VEGF, uh, of the inflammation in DME, in the causation of DME? So, this is an algorithm showing, you know, many molecules in addition to uh, VEGF uh, as a pathogenetic factor of uh, DME and primarily it includes addition molecules like ICAM and uh, integrins. So, besides VEGF, there might be various other pro-inflammatory agents responsible for DME. And in various studies, vitreous levels of VEGF, apart from VEGF, ICAM, IL-6 and MCP-1 was significantly higher in diabetic macular edema than in the vitreous samples of non-diabetic patients. So, it showed that the vitreous levels of these molecules had an influence of the retinal vascular permeability and the severity of macular edema secondary to diabetes mellitus. So, uh, you know, understanding more about these pro-inflammatory cytokines in DME will help future research of DME in identifying appropriate cytokines as biomarkers for individualized DME therapy apart from the standardized anti-VEGF therapy. So, now coming to the question, is dexamethasone uh, effective in inhibiting inflammatory cytokines? So, <clears throat> these are the RAT models and in these studies, dexamethasone down-regulated expression of VEGF and ICAM-1 in diabetic rats and it correlated with the effect on leukocyte accumulation. And it, the data revealed that it inhibits retinal accumulation of these cytokines, specifically blocking VEGF in addition, uh, specifically blocking ICAM in addition to VEGF. And uh, the clinical trial settings also showed the same and uh, 0.7 mg and even 0.35 mg of dexamethasone implants showed more than 15 letters of improvement as compared to sham in all the cases. The important point further taking that is that eyes which switched early to dexamethasone implant had better visual outcomes at 12 months. Eyes which uh, switched off after 12 months to dexamethasone implant from anti vegas also did well, but not to the magnitude of the eyes who uh, we switch, you know, early in the course of treatment. So, if there is so much evidence, why are we hesitant to give steroids early in the care of diabetic macular edema? There can be many reasons. Because uh, in the routine OPD and routine follow-ups, we are basically unaware in our busy OPDs of the suboptimal treatment with anti-VEGF in our everyday clinical practice. Or there might be hesitancy because of the concern of side effects, increased IOP or cataractogenesis of corticosteroids. These factors are the primary reason we are not using as a first-line therapy in diabetic macular edema. So looking at the evidence-based medicine, now it has been established in many conditions corticosteroids are the first-line treatment. It can be used as first line in pseudophagic eyes. It can be used first line in patients with cardiovascular events. It can be used first line in patients unwilling to attend or non-compliant to monthly injections. <clears throat> and it can be used in phagic eyes which do not have cataract and are not young and they're clear and crystalline. It is the per uh, preferred first line therapy in uh, serious retinal attachments with uh, HRF, hyperreflective foci, and many hard exudates. And again, it can be used as first line in patients who uh, are comorbid and not suitable for anti-VEGF and cannot come for regular checkups or regular shots of their anti-VEGF injections. So, it can reduce the treatment burden for individuals not able to come or cope up with the intensive anti-VEGF therapy and is a valid first-line alternative to anti-VEGF and should be the first choice in pseudophagic eyes. So, the key takeaways in steroids in diabetic macular edema is it's the first line, of course, we all agree is anti-VEGF agents. But many patients uh, fail to show uh, optimum outcome with the visual uh, response with intense, even after intensive therapy and monitoring. Because inflammation also plays a very important role in DME, specifically growth factors, cytokines and addition molecules. Intravitral corticosteroids are used in the management of DME as they block the production of VEGF in addition to ICAM and interleukins. And DEX implant shows efficacy in the treatment of DME along with a favorable uh, safety profile with very less chances of cataractogenesis and IOP rise. Coming to uh, vitrectomy and DME, I will not cover anti-VEGF agents and lasers because that has been covered by other speakers in this uh, instruction course. So, there are three indications of course. One is a definite indication which we have been doing for a very long time.
that is a physical traction, that is a taut posterior hyaloid membrane, uh, vitromolecular traction, or epiretinal membrane, which causes a recalcitrant edema, which is unresponsive to anti vegf or steroid injections. A relative indication is there is no traction, but there is a recalcitrant macular edema more than six months after multiple anti vegfs or steroid implant. And now some studies have shown a treatment naive DME, people are doing vitrectomy and peeling the ILM or the ERM uh, to reduce the macular thickness. All these surgeries uh, yield, as we have seen, excellent anatomical results with re reduction in central subfield thickness. And the rationale is uh, vitrectomy improves the vitreous oxygenation. It uh, reduces the amount of uh, vitreous VEGF and cytokine levels. And ILM pilling is beneficial for anatomical resolution of DME. And uh, hypothetically, visual improvement also. All in all, the common denominator is it leads to decreased subfovial thickness. A couple of videos here. So this is a routine diabetic vitrectomy uh, for a taut posterior hyaloid membrane. You need multiple stainings in these cases. After induction of the PV, uh, PVD, as you can see, there is a thick posterior hyaloid, which, uh, which is, you know, faintly stained with the uh, trimsilon acetonite crystals. And you can see that post, uh, taut posterior hyaloid membrane being removed with the, with the end grasping forceps. And mostly these are easy to peel and they come in one sheet. And uh, the case is not over yet because there is underlying ILM also, which does not get stained before the hyaloid membrane, the TPHM is peeled. We have stained it with BBG. This is the third dye we are using. And now you can see the ILM being peeled and clearly visible after three la uh, two layers of removal. And as, as I said, the anatomical results are wonderful. This was a vitromacular traction because of TPHM and the foveal uh, contour was restored after the surgery. Another case of, uh, you know, a thick ERM, a posterior, a taut posterior hyaloid membrane. Again, multiple stainings are used. Here we have used trypan blue to stain the uh, the thick ERM and you can see the patchy staining because of uh, the presence of a thick ERM over the fovea. This was uh, not, uh, you know, as uh, easy to remove in one go as in the previous case, but still we managed to do a wide peel and this is the membrane we were talking of which has been removed now and again you restain with the brilliant blue G and now you can see the ILM here. And now you, this is very important, otherwise it will cause a recurrence. And I peel ILM in all cases where I peel the epirental membrane and further augmentation of some laser. Of course, you have to be cautious in, you know, uh, cystoid edema where the, where the roof is very thin. And in this case, we, uh, we were peeling the ILM and it de-roofed the cystoid macular edema secondary to DME, causing a macular hole post-operatively. So indications and extent of these surgeries evolve with time, technology, and our viewing systems. And to go for a vitrectomy is no, you know, is not an easy call because every vitrectomy, especially a diabetic vitrectomy, is not a straightforward procedure. Vitrectomy, although it's an important tool in the treatment of select cases of T DME, especially those with a physical traction like TPHM or VMT or ERM. For treatment naive DME, further prospective studies are needed to define its role. The bottom line is you should explain to the patient and you should yourself be convinced that even if, our, even if the foveal contour is restored, a thinner macula does not correlate with improved visual acuity and it should be made adequately clear while you are counseling. Thank you so much. Thanks, Vishal, for